All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, for today's webinar. The legal implications—goodness, I can't even talk. The legal implications of opening safely, sponsored by the Chamber Small Business Committee. Today's presentation will be recorded, and we hope that you find the information shared today useful. Please enter your contact information into the chat if you'd like it shared with today's participants. If you have a question for Stephen, please enter it into the chat, or at the end of the presentation, there will be time for questions, and you can unmute yourself to ask your question. So today's presenter is Stephen Stern. Stephen is a partner with Kagan Stern, Marinella, and Beard. Stephen is a trusted legal advisor and zealous advocate for many businesses and individuals. Mr. Stern has litigated a wide variety of cases in federal and state courts in many jurisdictions, as well as in arbitration. He's developed a reputation as a hard-nosed litigator, an effective advisor who is a fast learner, and someone who can quickly identify important issues to help clients make informed decisions about resource allocation and risk assessment. Thank you for joining us today, Stephen, and the presentation is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Again, my humble apologies for having some uh, technological uh, difficulties this morning. I, I, well, I can't, I can't say it was something that I did, but I felt like as I was running through those problems, my uh, my uh, my lack of a technological background was coming to fruition and on display at the moment. Anyway, um, I will hopefully be able to see the questions as they come in with the screen set up the way it is. I may miss it, so just uh, indulge me if there's a delay in me recognizing a question that's asked. Um, my general preference for those of you that have not heard me before uh, give a presentation. I prefer questions to come as uh, as we go during the course of the presentation because they might be more timely might allow for more of a discussion on the topic that we're addressing at that time. So feel free to do that. You're certainly not interrupting. Uh, I welcome it. If you prefer to wait till the end, that's fine too. I try to be pretty flexible, uh, although my kids wouldn't uh, agree with that assessment. Um, all right, so legal implications of reopening safely. Uh, you know, as we get into this, there's no one size fits all approach to this. There are different risks for different businesses. Different industries have different needs, different businesses within the same industry have different needs, depending on what, uh, how you approach things and your flow of customers, what your employment situation is like in terms of how people interact in the office, can you do things remotely online? So keep in mind that as we go through this discussion today, this is really supposed to be just broad general guidelines of issues to consider, and then the solutions have to be tailored to your particular workplace or place of business, because it's not, as you'll see, it's not only focused only on employees. because And when we think about reopening safely, I think most people at first think about the employees, which is perfectly appropriate, but it's not only about making sure the employees are safe. You've got what are often referred to as business invitees, which are customers or clients, depending on your place of business, vendors who may come to your place of business, other third parties. And also there are uh, other situations. This could be in the employment setting, but I put it as a separate category uh, joint employment environments. And in our geographic area, uh, obviously with the number of government contractors, a lot of uh, uh, government contractors being on site at the place of uh, government client, or maybe not even in the government contractor setting. Lots of consulting businesses here where consultants show up on premise at their corporate clients and work collaboratively in that environment. And those are joint employment environments, uh, whether they technically meet the definition of joint employer, that's not really important for this purpose. I'm just trying to create an, an, a vision and an understanding of what the environment like, might look like and how to conceptually put our minds around these different issues that, or, or environments that we're gonna be talking about. So let's first talk about uh, the uh, employment situation, uh, employment environment. Often get questions, can employers require employees to be vaccinated? The answer is yes. Uh, the EOC has taken the position that you can require employees to be vaccinated, um, but there's there's always a but to it. It's not, it's not always one size fits all. You have to be mindful of the fact that maybe certain employees may not be able to be vaccinated because they're disabled under the definition of disability under the ADA. 
because of medical reasons, they may not be able to get vaccines. So then you may have to come up with a reasonable accommodation for them. And likewise, there are some employees who have sincerely held religious beliefs that object to the notion of taking vaccines. And this is not, this has been going on for a period of time. This is not unique to COVID-19, uh, where some employees, based on their religious views, they don't think uh, that getting a vaccine is inconsistent with them. And so again, what accommodations, if any, may be appropriate under those circumstances? So th those are things you have to uh, question. I know some people have raised the specter of, well, what if I do mandate that uh, employees get vaccinated and then someone gets sick or from the vaccine or the vaccine doesn't work? Is there any liability for the employer under those circumstances? Um, is it possible that lawsuits of that kind may be filed? Yes. Uh, do I think the likelihood of liability is high under those circumstances? No, I think it's probably quite low. I can't really uh, deem what the uh, legal theory would be and how it would be deemed unreasonable under the circumstances, considering what the CDC has been recommending, uh, other government agencies have been recommending, medical experts across the country have been recommending it. I, I can't fathom how that would be deemed to be an unreasonable employer under the circumstances, uh, unless if it is imposed on someone who advises you that you have that they have a medical condition that precludes them from uh, getting a vaccine. Now, when you are uh, going through when you're when you're faced with a situation where you have to uh, possibly provide a reasonable accommodation, Normally under the ADA, you have to go through what's called the interactive process, where you sit down with the employee, get an understanding of what his or her medical needs are, or his, limitation, his or her limitations are. You have an understanding of what they are and how those can be accommodated. Uh, and it is literally an interactive process where you have a, a discussion and the employee is supposed to be disclosing to the employer what his or her needs are, what the limitations are, and how that might affect the workflow. Now, one thing that is important to keep in mind, and this is something where a lot of people get tripped up, just because the employee demands a particular type of accommodation doesn't mean that's the one that the employer must provide. Uh, the obligation of the employer under these circumstances is to provide a reasonable accommodation, not the reasonable accommodation that the employee wants. <clears throat> now, an, an accommodation that imposes an undue hardship on the business by definition is not reasonable. And that's a whole factual analysis as well as well. What's the nature and cost of the accommodation? What are the financial resources of the facility? So if you have a multi-facility uh, business, what are the uh, resources of that particular facility? And then you look at the same thing for the overall company as a whole. Uh, what are the number of employees that work at a particular facility? And the same thing with the company as a whole. Uh, the nature of the employer's operation, including the functions of the workforce. Well, how would the accommodation affect the workflow? Would it change the job responsibilities? Uh, because again, the obligation for when you're providing reasonable accommodation is to allow the employee to perform the essential functions of the job. So if you have to alter the uh, essential functions of the job, that by definition is not a reasonable accommodation as well. Um, and to try to really put this in perspective, I know this is generally targeted towards small businesses. But let's uh, do a compare and contrast. If you're, let's say, General Electric, one of the biggest companies in the world with billions of dollars of resources uh, at, at your hand at, your, at the um, that are available to the company, and then you've got facilities everywhere, and you've got thousands and thousands of employees. Obviously, that company's ability to provide a reasonable accommodation is going to be much greater than a small mom and pa type shop that's a local business that has just a few employees, maybe it's a small retail establishment, maybe a small uh, professional services establishment, just a few employees. Resources are vastly different and the effect on the uh, business is very different. That's just to really create a clear uh, contrast there. Now, what are potential reasonable accommodations? Um, I'm essentially going over the list here of what's been going on for the last several months, but now there's a lot of confusion out there. I'm sure a lot of people have heard from the CDC the sudden change in circumstances and recommendations about masks if people are vaccinated. But we also know we're facing a, a challenge overall as a society and, and as businesses 
Well, we know there's going to be a substantial portion of the population that is not likely to get vaccinated um, because they don't believe in it. They reject it either politically. Obviously, there are some that are, uh, I don't want to say the word, uh, I'm trying to think of a different word, but there are some people that are politically motivated to reject the vaccine. And there are other people that are religiously motivated and there are other people that are motivated uh, out of uh, medical needs. Uh, the latter two are protected by law. The first one is not. I guess arguably it'll be interesting if uh, if any of the people on the line here have an office location or employee that works in the District of Columbia. And because their political affiliation is a protected characteristic under DC law, I wonder if someone's going to try to make an argument that if uh, an employer requires him or her to get a vaccine and that based on their political views, following uh, the lead of uh, certain political ideologies in this country these days, maybe they're going to claim that that's discrimination on the basis of uh, political affiliation. I think that's not likely to succeed, but I'm just, you know, part of the, you know, part of my job is to get, get creative with theories and see how they may play out. Um, but what about even seemingly wearing masks? Um, again, from a liability standpoint, it's not clear how that's going to play out going forward. On the one hand, we know masks are generally designed when we wear them, it's really protecting mo mostly the people around us. There is some protection for the person wearing the mask. Um, so how is that going to play out going forward? That's not entirely clear, but that still remains a viable uh, potential accommodation or one step or one of perhaps multiple steps that can be followed to protect employees. Um, what about if you have, a, you know, depending on the size of your workforce, another possibility is having employees certify that uh, they are not experiencing any symptoms of COVID-19. And when you request them to make that certification, you can only ask about the employees themselves, not whether or not the family members are experiencing those symptoms. Now, why would that be useful? I know for some businesses that continued to operate when the pandemic uh, was going uh, much stronger and that there were far more cases uh, happening, uh, one of the steps that some businesses took was that each, each employee who showed up every day at the office would have to certify that they, didn't, they weren't experiencing certain symptoms. Now, here's a little bit of the challenge if you take that approach. Uh, the EOC allows you to ask not whether or not you're asking, whether your you know, employee's experiencing symptoms of COVID-19, you've got to ask the specific symptoms. And then the burden is on the employer to be keeping up to date with what those symptoms are. Now, they don't seem to be changing too much as of late, but obviously as we continue to learn more about this disease, there could be certain new updates. So you can ask specifically, are you experiencing a temperature, uh, fever? Are you experiencing a loss of smell, a loss of taste, fatigue? Other uh, symptoms, you have to go down that checklist and they'd say, no, 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 then you obviously allow them to come in. They're experiencing those symptoms, you can instruct them to possibly go home. Obviously, that's a little bit of a challenge now as we are in the middle of allergy season. Um, some of the symptoms do uh, overlap with allergies, so you have some decisions to make. Perhaps before sending the employee home, you have a dialogue with him or her uh, to find out, do they have allergies? And for example, if, if it were me and uh, my, my boss were to come to me and say, what gives Stern? And I said, well, you know, it's like clockwork every year in May or June, I develop a cold. I have a little bit of a sore throat, some congestion. Um, maybe then they'll, they'll, under those circumstances, they'll say, all right, you can come into the office. Uh, but if I don't answer the questions that way, maybe it's such that it's not a good idea and perhaps it's better off that I stay home. Steve, uh, Matt Hauser. Sure. Um, Matt. Can we interject a question here? Sure, thank so, you for doing that. Without being, I mean, obviously COVID, I guess, is the um, reason for all of our um, enhanced concerns and everything, but we sort of have a policy that look, if you're not feeling well, it's better that you just stay home. And that applies to upset stomach, um, you know, other things. So are we, if we just say, look, you know, if you're not feeling well, just stay home. We okay? I think that, I think that would probably be fine because you're not, because a couple things there. One, under those circumstances, you're not asking the employee to disclose any medical information. You're just saying on the honor code, hey, if you're not feeling well, we are instructing you to stay home. 
Um, that could be driven by COVID. It could be driven by other reasons for, hey, you just don't want people to spread whatever illness they may have. And I think that would that would be fine. Um, particularly in the COVID environment, your employers are given a lot more latitude uh, under those circumstances. One thing that may come up over time though, if, you know, hey, you're not feeling well, whatever that, however low that threshold may be, uh, employees may run out of leave a little bit more quickly and then come the end of the calendar, calendar year, excuse me, um, you might have uh, some employee relations issues on your hands. And that's gonna be the same thing with any of these other uh, accommodations. Um, you know, mask wearing now, uh, obviously there's gonna be a large segment of that of people are going to uh, object. Um, but I think generally speaking, you should be, particularly while the, the COVID situation is still happening, you're on pretty solid ground. Um, <clears throat> Stephen, there's another question in the chat. How does an employer know if you were vaccinated? Ah, that is a good question. And um, I think I had that on perhaps one of the uh, other slides later on, but I'll bring that up right now. And that's one of the challenges with taking that approach. It's the honor system. I know at the outset of when uh, vaccines were being um, administered, there was seemed to be a somewhat of a push to have you know, what people were referring to as the uh, vaccine passport. Um, and there's been no uniform way to verify that that is the case. I think one thing though, uh, so along those lines, what an employer may want to do uh, under those circumstances, if you are mandating vaccines or if you're treating people differently, if they've been vaccinated, uh, you have employees sign something certifying that they've been vaccinated. Um, and that that you know a lot that means they're obviously in a safer place. Uh, you can make certain representations to your customers under those circumstances. Um, uh, and so I, I think that would be uh, fine. If you can mandate that you can that if you can mandate that they get the vaccine, I think you can mandate that they disclose that they've been vaccinated. Um, so I think that'd be the way to approach it. Okay, and there's one other question in the chat, and I apologize, I stepped away to, to make coffee. Um, no, no problem. I'm wondering why it's not coming up on my end, So, but I'm glad you're okay. pointing that, pointing that out. I'll, I'll monitor the chat for you so we don't miss any. Okay, um, good. It says, since the vaccines are currently under emergency youth authorization from the FDA, my understanding is that an employer cannot require an employee to be vaccinated. Can you comment on that? Um, that's not what the EOC has, has stated on that position. The EOC has stated employers can require vaccines. So um, I, I'm not sure where the, um, the guidance came from because it's emergency use, um, but uh, that is inconsistent with what the EOC's position has been. Okay. Um, let's see. Now, uh, now you could also administer COVID-19 tests. Uh, that obviously can get pretty expensive. So I don't really think that's practical for, particularly for small businesses. Uh, to what degree of frequency will you be doing that? Um, and obviously there's going to be some, um, some pushback on that as well. You can continue to utilize barriers. I think we're gonna see permanent changes uh, as we go into different establishments about how, um, um, either stores or office spaces are set up to have those plexiglass uh, barriers um, or um, you know tables that people have been creating creating some separation to continue some form of social distancing. That is uh, that is a possibility. Um, you know it was interesting. I've already had to go to court a few times uh, in the last month or so, and even seeing different courtrooms how they are set up. I don't know whether this is going to be a long-term change or not, but in one courtroom, you know, I had to sit down, this is a multi-party case, and I had to sit down at the counsel table right next to an attorney that I didn't know that was also on the same side of the V as me. Uh, in another courtroom, there was plexiglass between me and my co-counsel, one of my colleagues here at my firm, uh, she and I had a hearing together, and there was literally plexiglass separating us at the same table. Um, so different ways are gonna be uh, handled in different work environments. And people are going to have to, uh, I think that's one thing that we're going to continue to see going forward. Another example, again, these are not, by the way, I want to be clear, these are not an exhaustive list 
of possible accommodations, but job restructuring. You heard me allude to the need for essential functions before. The issue with uh, job restructuring is you could possibly modify certain job functions if they're considered marginal job functions, but you do not have to alter or eliminate what are essential job functions. And this goes in, and this is really uh, important where you're getting out front on these things. And it's uh, lots of businesses, particularly on the smaller ones, but even some pretty uh, you know, mid-sized and, and big, big companies don't have written job descriptions done in advance. And why is that important? Because courts have generally been pretty deferential to businesses, not complete deference, but fairly deferential uh, over the years when employers have a written job description before an employee comes to him or her with a need for a reasonable accommodation. And that job description identifies what the essential job functions are. Um, remember, essential is different than marginal. Marginal may be, hey, it's, an, it's a function that you do from time to time. It's not really essential, um, but it's something that we, we expect this person to do. Marginal function is something that can be eliminated, would be appropriate for uh, accommodation purposes. Now, one that I think is going to be a real uh, fascinating development over time is telecommuting. Certain businesses, you know, tend to be white collar businesses or at least businesses with white collar functions have been able to transition and adapt fairly well in the COVID environment by allowing telecommuting. Um, and so that's been a significant development. There are many people that believe this is going to be a long term permanent uh, development. Um, I'm not so sure because I think while this is a uh, trend now, I still, in my, my belief, is that we as human beings are still, uh, most of us, certainly not all of us, but mo many of us are uh, geared towards and really uh, need that social interaction and really want to be in those office environments to get a change of pace and have that uh, human interaction. Um, whether or not that's going to be a long-term trend or not, I'm not sure. I think it will be to some extent because there's certain, certainly some elements of the population that relish this opportunity to work from home, not have to go anywhere, just walk downstairs uh, or stay in their bedroom and get to work right away and by hopping on their computer. Um, but why is that important from a legal standpoint? Well, um, I don't know if uh, you may have seen one of my blog posts at the beginning of the, the pandemic. One of the concerns that I had, and I think will be an interesting legal development over time, is for many years, courts have been fairly deferential when employers have identified uh, physical presence in the workplace as an essential function. And so if that has been deemed to be an essential function of a particular employee's job, how does this telecommuting change that? Now we've been able to see for the better part of a year that lots of employees who previously had to be on site now have been somehow been able to function uh, in a remote environment. Does that mean factually the employer's previous determination that physical presence in the, at, the work in, at the work site was an essential function of the job? I don't know. That's going to be something that's going to be, that's going to be evolved, that's going to evolve and be determined over time in the courts. The EOC has come out with a statement and has provided guidance stating that uh, the fact that telecommuting was provided as an accommodation during the pandemic does not necessarily mean that uh, telecommuting is, a, is an appropriate reasonable accommodation um, going forward now that we're, I don't want to say we're out of the pandemic, but we're hopefully coming out of the pandemic. Um, and so, and in that statement, it is a very, which is what I've said before, is, it is a very fact-determinative, fact-intensive analysis to understand is the telecommuting uh, reasonable or not is physical presence in the workplace essential function of the job. And that is going to really be a business to business determination. It's a job function by job function determination. And it's not going to be easy. I think lots of businesses are going to have to dig in on this stuff. Um, I do have some concerns that showing that this temporarily for a year plus uh, will certainly undermine, uh, not certainly, it, will, it has a substantial uh, pos uh, uh, risk of undermining uh, that determ previous determination that uh, telecommuting uh, or physical presence in the workplace was an essential function. Hope I made that clear. I, 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 this usually triggers some questions, so I'm going to specifically try to open it up 
here for a moment, see if uh, anyone has any questions on the concept of telecommuting as an accommodation and what it means going forward. Okay, I guess not. All right, what is another uncertainty that businesses are going to face going forward? And as, as a, in particular, as it relates to telecommuting. So um, one thing that I was at, I've been asked on and off throughout the pandemic is, well, which state's law governs? And so typically, um, there's obviously in, in the area of employment law, there's federal laws that govern the workplaces as long as you have sufficient number of employees that um, are that would subject you to the federal statutes. And then there's state law, uh, state laws as well that govern the employment relationship. And those are typically applied by based on where the employee is working. So, you know, let's even though an employee may be telecommuting, I'm not telecommuting, may be commuting from another jurisdiction, but working in Maryland, well, if the employee is commuting from DC or commuting from Virginia to work physically in Maryland, well, then Maryland law is typically going to uh, apply to that employee. But now we have an environment, particularly in this ge geographic area, where we have employees that live in multiple jurisdictions and perhaps all, prior to the pandemic commuted from Virginia to Maryland, from West Virginia to Maryland, from DC to Maryland, or from Maryland to Virginia or to DC or elsewhere, Pennsylvania. And so now that employees have been telecommuting, the question is, well, if they're commute, if they're working in Pennsylvania, in West Virginia, in Virginia, in DC, and they're telecommuting, does that mean those states' laws govern and apply to those employees commuting from those telecommuting from those jurisdictions? And my position during the pandemic was while it was temporary, similar to the telecommuting reasonable accommodation, while it was temporary, I think it, it was a reasonable position to take and, and believe that most courts will conclude, no, if the employee was physically working in Maryland prior to the pandemic, then Maryland law likely would continue to govern, at least for the foreseeable future. But now, what about those work environments where, where the work dynamic has changed? What about now if you are adapting a long-term telecommuting approach? You may now, it's unclear, I don't know what the outcome is going to be, but I think there's a stronger case in those instances, um, but not necessarily, it's not, it's not necessarily going to be this outcome, that the employee telecommuting from Virginia, the employee telecommuting from uh, West Virginia or DC or, or, or Pennsylvania, he or she may now be subject to that state's law. Uh, just I've even had some, uh, some clients where they've had employees leave the area and they've permanently moved to Florida saying, hey, this is where I'm going to be living going forward. I can do my job remotely and there's no reason why they, uh, we can't have employees working from all around the country. Um, so that's going to be a, uh, an area that's going to evolve, and I think it's going to play out over time. I do think there is a substantial risk that if you have a long-term uh, work situation where someone telecommuting from that jurisdiction, that jurisdiction's law is going to apply. And so you have to be familiar with more employment laws than perhaps you did otherwise if you all had all your employees working solely in Maryland. Um, another uh, issue coming out uh, as we reopen is the extension of the tax credits for paid leave. Now, I don't know if you remember, but under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, there was mandatory uh, paid leave uh, under, for employers under 500 employees for uh, certain circumstances. If the employee was subject to government quarantine or isolation order. The employee advised, was advised by a healthcare professional to self-quarantine. The employee experiencing COVID-19 symptoms was seeking a medical diagnosis. And if an employee is caring for an individual subject to a government quarantine order or advised to self-quarantine by a healthcare professional, the employee is caring for a child whose school or child care provider was unavailable. Under those circumstances, you had to have, provide uh, leave. That is no longer required. So you're saying to, you're maybe asking yourself, well, Stern, if it's no longer required, why are you telling us about this? Well, because under the American Rescue Plan Act, of 2021, the tax credits that employers were able to get on the Family First uh, Coronavirus uh, Act, emergency, I'm sorry, I always get the words confused. The Families First Coronavirus Response Act, um, those tax credits um, are have been extended through the um, 
pay RPA, those tax credits are now available for people, for companies that voluntarily provide those forms of leave through September 30th, 2021. So that's a significant development. In addition, under the statute, the ARPA has expanded the reasons on which leave can be provided and still qualify for the tax credit. And that is if an employee is taking leave to obtain the COVID-19 vaccine, or if an employee is recovering from injury, illness, or disability related to a COVID-19 uh, test. Um, uh, and then if the employee is exposed to COVID-19, the employer has requested a COVID-19 test. Uh, so under those circumstances, you can still get the uh, tax credit. And just to be clear, there was uh, it was previously extended, uh, even though that tax credit ran out at the end of 2020, it was previously extended through uh, the end of March, 2021, and it's been extended again through the ARPA. And um, again, if you aren't trying to take the tax credit, then you don't necessarily have to do any, you, you, as you said, you're not required. Correct. So it's just a matter of if you, out of the kindness of your heart or whatever, um, you know, do it, then you may get a tax benefit. Absolutely, and good clarification. None of these forms of leave are required. Um, now, arguably leave may be required under the FMLA generally, but that's unpaid leave. All these requirements for paid leave at this point are voluntary. And it is only if, uh, and then if you do give these forms of paid leave voluntarily, as you said, Matt, you are eligible to get those tax credits through, so if, as long as the leave is taken through September 30th of this year. Um, depending on how the summer goes, I wouldn't be surprised if that gets extended again. We'll see what happens with the uh, case uh, frequency, but uh, for now, it's only through the end of September. Now, something else to keep in mind uh, as people return to the office, you know, um, even during the, uh, when people were working remotely frequently, I was still um, surprised, surprise may be too strong a word because I've been doing this long enough. Uh, I see all sorts of crazy things that people do. Uh, but I thought for sure we would see the rate of it, the incident of unlawful harassment um, decrease it had to some extent, but it was still happening with a decent amount of frequency. Some really crazy stories of people doing things online through remote uh, uh, video uh, meetings and so on and so forth. So now that we're coming back into the workplace where people are interacting uh, on a more regular basis, face to face, the opportunities for people to make uh, inappropriate comments and to say offensive things and engage in offensive conduct obviously will increase uh, substantially. And uh, I don't think I'm saying anything uh, that's uh, surprising considering how much it's been in the news lately, but obviously the rate of incidents of uh, discrimination and bigoted conduct that's been directed at people of Asian descent has uh, been on the rise uh, in part because of the false premise and the false uh, accusation that uh, COVID-19 is, uh, uh, is, you know, well, yes, the first case came in China, but uh, uh, that doesn't mean it was, uh, you know, this is a Chinese specific uh, disease. Um, uh, and so there's been a lot of false conspiracy theories out there and people coming up with derogatory terms for COVID-19 that, um, you know, uh, make a, an Asian connection to it. I'm not going to repeat those. Uh, they're clearly offensive and not appropriate, but you can uh, imagine uh, what those are. So while I want to be mindful, and you see at the bottom, you're towards the bottom of this slide, be mindful of all forms of discrimination. I think one in particular to be on the lookout for um, as we're come, hopefully coming out of COVID-19 is harassment and discrimination against people of Asian descent. Um, also, there's been a uh, rapid rise in anti-Semitism in recent years. Um, and now as we are returning to the workplace, uh, the physical workplace again, um, obviously, there's been a lot uh, about Israel in the news and Gaza and um, the number of statements that have been made. Um, and, you know, while, again, people like to, to justify their critiques of Israel as it's policy based, but yet you'd be amazed at how often when you hear someone justifying their statements or conduct on that, they are statements that apply to all Jews. 
And that is uh, clearly uh, not a pro. If you want to have criticisms of Israel, uh, that may be one thing, but to make comments about all uh, uh, Jews, that's something else. Uh, even under the definition, the, uh, there's a international Holocaust uh, remembrance definition of uh, anti-Semitism, which does include uh, inappropriate criticisms of Israel. Um, so that's a form of anti-Semitism as well. So again, just be mindful that these things might be happening uh, at, at this particular time. Um, you know, I will just say as, and I, uh, you know, it's one thing to criticize a country, it's another thing to criticize it unfairly and holding it to standards that no one else is held to. When you do the latter, that's uh, a form of bigotry. Uh, when you do the former, well, any country can be criticized. Uh, so uh, make sure you're being mindful of the difference between the two. Um, as I mentioned, be aware of other forms of discrimination as we return to the workplace. Um, I don't want to overlook um, racism generally. Um, I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not aware of any incidents that are specific to COVID-19 or any particular developments happening uh, at this point in time. Obviously, we've seen a lot of horrific incidents generally in, in recent uh, months or last year or two. Um, and so uh, I think that's just something that everyone should be on, should be on everyone's mind as a general matter. Um, and, but I, I, I don't have anything specific to um, you know, COVID to talk to about or a particular uh, development in the news as of this point in time. One thing that's coming up though, and as we return to the workforce uh, or the physical uh, office location is uh, political discourse. And this has come up in some instances uh, where I've had to um, uh, give companies some advice, where nowadays it seems like everything is politicized, uh, which is a bit dangerous in a lot of respects. Um, and so how are businesses going to handle this? You heard me mention earlier, um, if you have any employees that work in the District of Columbia, political affiliation is a protected characteristic. So we gotta be mindful of the particular local laws where employees are working. Um, it, as these issues come up. And even then though, it gets a little bit touchy and a little bit delicate um, when even some people will claim this is a political dialogue when perhaps it's blurring the lines between um, maybe some form of uh, discrimination based on a protected characteristic under applicable federal laws. You heard me talk a little bit about the Israel-Gaza situation. I, uh, in other situation, I saw it came up in the race context, which is a little bit uh, um, uh, problematic and uh, how people were claiming it was political speech, but there were some, certainly some racial elements that were being uh, identified and, and injected into the dialogue. So, um, you know, companies have to be aware that this could be more of an, a, a, could be a potentially uh, delicate situation. Um, it doesn't really lead to political li liability, I mean, uh, legal liability. Unless if, again, you've got that gray area where someone is talking about uh, something under the guise of political uh, discourse, when it really may be a cover for some other form of nefarious discrimination. Now, outside of the employment uh, dynamic, what about customers, clients, vendors, other third parties, uh, these business invitees? You know, one thing in terms of liability, if an employee comes to the office and gets sick at your workplace or on the job, um, that's typically going to be covered uh, by a worker's compensation if there's any uh, you know, medical bills or other issues that uh, arise from that. But that doesn't apply to the business invitees. It doesn't apply to people who are not your uh, employees. Um, so what are you going to do? about those people that are visiting your workplace if they're not employed by you? Are you gonna to continue to require masks? Again, and this is an example where you got, the, the different businesses are gonna have very different approaches. We've seen this now with, um, you know, um, some very big retailers coming to very different conclusions. Some are still gonna be applying the mask wearing uh, policies, others are not. So it's gonna really vary from business to business how they wanna approach this. I think it's a little bit more manageable on the small business side, um, depending on how you want to manage the flow of, um, of customers into your uh, place of business. 
like for example, smaller retailers may be able to do uh, to manage the flow of people coming in and out of their, their place of business. They may be more able to manage the mask wearing uh, um, policy and practice if that's what they were to choose to do. Um, are you going to require vaccination? So someone had asked earlier about, you know, there's, you know, how do you verify? And I don't know how you can do this for, for business invitees. Again, maybe you could, depending on certain invitees, again, I don't see this being practical for all customers of your retail establishment, but are you going to, how are you going to maybe with the consultants or some, maybe some segment of the population, maybe you're going to ask people to certify that that's the case if you're going to invite them in. Um, do you need to offer a reasonable accommodation? Well, why do I ask that? Well, I actually have a case right now for a client where they have a, it's a retail establishment and uh, this, you know, several months ago, someone came into their place of business and refused to wear a mask under the premise that uh, it violated their religious beliefs to wear a face cover. Um, and so they, the business took the position, look, this is being, you know, there, there's a, you know, a statement from, from the governor saying that businesses should require people to wear masks. There was local uh, guidance about mask wearing and the customer said, no, it violates my religious beliefs. Yet in this instance, this business was able to offer an accommodation under those circumstances by saying that, look, we have a uh, much slower and much lighter customer flow uh, early in the morning between eight and nine. You could come back then if you'd like, and there are fewer people here. And so the risk of being in our place of business without a mask on uh, to our other customers is much lower. And so we invite you to come back then and that person refused. And I feel like we have a very, very, very strong defense to this. There was even questions as to whether or not this religious belief was sincerely held. Um, but nevertheless, um, this is something that you may have to encounter depending on the nature of your business. Uh, the joint employment environments. So, you know, uh, depending on the nature of your business, are, I review the applicable contracts. Are there any particular provisions that require you to coordinate with your, you know, your, your, uh, your co-employer or the consultant or the other business in which you're sharing the workspace with? Um, are there any obligations to discuss, address these uh, return to work or health and safety issues? Um, doesn't happen too often, but you never know. Maybe during the pandemic, some new provisions were included and people are going to be uh, looking at that. So as you return to the work, uh, physical work environment, uh, look at that. Even if there are no uh, contractual obligations, if you are in a co-working environment or co or work sharing environment with other businesses, do you want to come up with a plan of action? Because maybe you're going to be requiring that your employees continue to mask, but what if, what if the other business that's in that same workplace is not going to be requiring their employees to wear masks? How is that going to play out? How is that going to be handled? Are you going to have some objections from your employees? Are they going to be concerned? What if you have an employee that cannot be vaccinated that's in that environment and there's co uh, other people there that are not wearing masks? Um, do you, are you going to find out if they're going to be all vaccinated? So there's issues that you need to be thinking about in that co-workspace environment that I think may require some coordination. And again, that's uh, probably most likely in the government contractor setting and in the uh, consultant uh, space where uh, people from other businesses are spending their time in someone else's workplace. What about other business decisions? And so with telecommuting, you know, we talked a little bit before, will this be a long-term change? Well, if that's the case, um, maybe you're going to have new office space requirements. Uh, you may not need as much space uh, to rent anymore. Do you need to negotiate new lease terms? Or are you going to need to be trying to, uh, uh, if you are not taking up as much space, are you going to then try to sublease some of the space until your lease runs out? These are going to be some issues and decisions that you're going to have to uh, uh, undertake, and some of which may require some uh, assistance from legal counsel on the contract side of things. Um, does this alter your insurance needs by any chance? Are you now shutting down some places that uh, some office locations that you didn't uh, that you used before that you may not need, or maybe there's some limitation on uh, some of the needs, uh, some of the uh, insurance needs you may have, depending on the more limited workspace. 
What about training your employees on cybersecurity? Um, notice now the second time I've had its parentheses open and not closed. So I'll have to fix that going forward. My apologies about the typos. Um, anyway, um, if any of you would uh, listen to a presentation at the beginning of the pandemic that uh, again from the Central Maryland Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, Chris uh, Reese Mandel um, uh, spoke a lot about how the incidents of hacking went skyrocketed at the beginning of the pandemic with so many people working from home. Uh, people make mistakes with more people being online. Uh, their home computer setup is not as secure as perhaps a uh, office environment. And so if you're gonna have employees working from home on a long-term basis, if you haven't already trained them up about cybersecurity needs, you should be doing it uh, uh, certainly going forward. And it doesn't even really, sh shouldn't even be limited to uh, those situations where people are working uh, from home. As we just saw, again, a big story in the news with the Colonial Pipeline, uh, a big company, lots of resources, and they were subject uh, to uh, hackers um, where they were, where they, where they were, had uh, ransomware on their uh, server and they couldn't operate that pipeline for a period of time. So I, I think we're gonna see hacks becoming more and more common. These uh, ransomware incidences are uh, be, being successful and that they're getting people to pay. Um, and so I think we're gonna see that more often. So if you're in a remote environment, you certainly wanna be uh, mindful of that. Even if you're not in a remote environment, you wanna educate your employees on their vulnerability, train them to be suspicious about um, um, attachments to emails that are unexpected, links from emails that are unexpected. Even if it's someone that you think you know, um, I still encourage people to train their employees to have their spidey senses up, so to speak. And why do I say that? And here's an example where I, that specifically happened to me. Fortunately, I, I have a healthy degree of uh, uh, skepticism or, or some may say paranoia. I have a little, self, um, you know, a little uh, joke about myself. But anyway, um, the, I got an email from someone that I knew or purporting to be someone that I knew. And it just didn't seem right the way the email was worded. It just it struck me as this is not this is not kosher. So I emailed the person back saying, "Hey, did you plan to send? Did you intend to send me this? And what's in the attachment?" And then I got a prompt response back from the person saying, "Yes, I need you to take a look at this." And the way the again that reply email came across, it just didn't. The wording just didn't add up. I, again, I was suspicious. My something was telling me this isn't legitimate. And sure enough, through and I had another means of communicating with that person, and I asked uh, that person whether or not this was uh, her speaking to me, and she said, "No, it's not. Thank you for letting me know." So some of these hacks could be so sophisticated where they're actually in control of the person's email and not just sending you uh, um, phishing emails with links and attachments, but they may even be responding to you if you uh, if you send an email inquiring of them. So hopefully you'll, if you train employees to be, have a healthy dose of uh, skepticism um, and to be suspicious and make appropriate inquiries and hopefully have more than one means of communicating with someone if you're in doubt. And if not, then I think you still have to be cautious, isolate it, maybe you have your tech team look at the email to investigate and find out. Um, will there be office sharing? Again, going back to the telecommuting concept. If people are gonna be telecommuting more often, there may be more, more office sharing environments. Maybe not everyone's going to have an office to him or herself. And if that's the case, maybe you're going to have two or three people that are going to rotate through one particular office. And if that's the case, are there going to be privacy issues? Are people often leave things in desk drawers? Well, you have to maybe remind them. I don't think there's going to be liability necessarily from invasion of privacy. If people are told, listen, you're going to be sharing an office space with one, two, or however many other people. So make sure that anything that is deemed private, you don't leave around because other people in this business are going to be accessing those same drawers, that same workplace, workspace, and you, have, you should have no expectation of privacy there. You do that and you've got a, an appropriate defense. There shouldn't be any claim of, uh, uh, of uh, invasion of privacy there. But I think it also raises another issue that you want to be mindful of. Some people may keep certain 
um, items in their workspace. They could be uh, religious items, cultural items, and people might be asking uh, questions that come across really inappropriately. Um, that when they when it could be a genuine, it could in, at times be a genuinely curious question about someone's background, understanding what this is. Other times, those questions could be really come across as deeply offensive. Um, but also, some of those uh, items could also be genuinely um, uh, offensive to some people. There was a case, it's not the same uh, context where someone is sharing a workspace, but there was a case in California a few years ago where um, someone would come to the office with a shirt that had a, um, uh, that cited to a, a Bible verse um, that was uh, denigrating to um, um, uh, people who are gay and would make comments about that in the workplace and saying that this is an expression of my religion. And the business took the position, no, no, you are harassing your gay coworkers. And so they, when the person with, who had the religious beliefs uh, against homosexuality um, sued after he was fired saying, you discriminated against me on the basis of my religion. And the California court in that instance said, well, no, that's not discrimination. Um, you were harassing people based on their sexual orientation. And it wasn't, uh, well, you, you could still have your religious beliefs, but you didn't have to be expressing them in that way at that work in the workplace. So uh, that'd be one, I could see some instances like that possibly coming up in work sharing agreements where arrangements where pay, perhaps people may be not trying to uh, flaunt that in the face of other people, but what if they're sharing a space with someone and they see either some reference to a Bible verse or something else of someone else's background that could be deemed uh, hostile to that background. Again, that's not automatically going to be liability. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be, but you want to again be doing train people and be mindful of being open to people of other backgrounds, whatever those other backgrounds are. Um, and then uh, one other item here to say is uh, what change is this going to make on uh, compensation? Uh, think about perhaps now if you're going to be incurring lesser charges. Um, from having lower rent requirements going forward. Um, perhaps that's going to free up some money for pay raises, um, maybe different bonus structures, things of that nature, and make sure that that's done in a way that is not discriminatory, um, where there's an adverse impact or just uh, a differential treatment, whether on any protected characteristic, whether it be sex uh, or any of the other protected characteristics that are out there. That is uh, really it. Uh, we, oh, just a, just a few moments short of an hour. So I timed this pretty well. Um, I'm happy to leave it open to any questions people may want to ask for the next few minutes. And uh, hopefully you found today's discussion uh, meaningful and helpful. Thank you, Stephen. Hi, um, I do have a, another question regarding my earlier question about um, employers having legally being able to require vaccines because the vaccines under emergency use authorization. And I put in the chat, um, cause we, there was, and I, maybe Kim, you can help me with this. There was another webinar and I don't know if it was something, I, I didn't have time to go back and look in my email, but I was, was another law firm. And um, I don't know if it was CMC that put the webinar on, or maybe it was another chamber. Um, but there were, um, and I can't even remember the attorney's name of the, the group, but it was about, um, specifically about this, this question, can employers legally require that a person be vaccinated? And that attorney stated that they could not because of the emergency use authorization language. And so when I went to the website and I put a link uh, that I found from the FDA website and then also attached a little screenshot and the language from the FDA is states that um, the FDA must ensure that recipients of the vaccine under an emergency use authorization are informed. And then I'll, you know, dot, 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 um, the extent to which such benefits and risks are, um, or of the known potential benefits and risks, and the extent to which such benefits and risks are unknown 
and that they have the option to accept or refuse the vaccine. So that's, so that's again, I'm just bringing it up since that languaging is on the FDA website. What can, can you speak to from a legal liability perspective, what that could mean? So um, the, so there's a couple things. I think that language is there to protect the vaccine manufacturers because it's not been formally approved by the FDA to say we with certainty this is safe. I remember when uh, I, I first saw the this you know the disclaimer about hey this is not approved by the FDA. I, I, at first I was like what and then I mean I, it just hit me for a second then I realized like oh yeah it's not this is under an emergency use authorization uh, uh, and so it is not because normally our as you know our normal approval process is years in the making. I mean these vaccines haven't even been out for an entire year yet. Uh, we've only had COVID-19 a little over a year uh, circulating. So that's the that's giving the ma vaccine manufacturers some some cover there. Now, as far as, um, and so that's also saying at the end there, if I remember the language correctly, you know, individuals have to make their own decisions. Um, and so now that that doesn't mean that the employers are precluded from saying, we want you to get vaccinated if you're gonna come back to the office. Um, I don't see those as being mutually exclusive. Um, and I think they, those can go in tandem. Now there's, remember there's still exceptions to the, um, to the mandate if an employer were to do that to, uh, to getting the vaccine is if you, if you are um, unable to get it for medical reasons or for the sincerely held religious beliefs. Um, my daughter, uh, my oldest daughter, for example, um, when at first she couldn't get it when the recommendation was that people with severe allergies shouldn't be getting the vaccine. And so that had to play out for a period of time. Now the recommendation is at least the Pfizer vaccine is safe for those that have uh, allergies. So she can go get that one. So, you know, may, if for whatever reason, let's play out a scenario where, you know, hey, Pfizer is not available uh, in those circumstances and she's in the workforce. She says, look, I can't get the vaccine until I can get a Pfizer one. That That's when where there's got to be some give and take with the employer there, if that were to be the case. Do you, do you know of any lawsuits that have been filed or currently um, under review? Maybe they haven't run their course yet because this is fairly new where someone, an employer, and this could also go towards universities with requiring you know, students um, who aren't employees, but then also whether or not they require their employees. And I'm just curious, and maybe time will tell since this is a new situation, if that language that's clearly out there in the public on the FDA website, if an attorney if was representing a plaintiff in a lawsuit um, that either they were denied, um, they were fired or maybe denied access or, or you know, admission into a university that they were accepted to because they chose not to get the emergency use authorization vaccine. Could, I mean, if, speaking from a, a lawyer's point of view and you were asked to represent that person, would, do you think you'd have a case? I think no, unless it fits into one of those exceptions that I was talking to, uh, or talking about. It wasn't one of those exceptions because it, the languaging doesn't, I mean, even though those exceptions are clearly known for all vaccines that are out there that have passed beyond that emergency use or never even went through that phase, they went through the normal trials and were approved, this not being the case, and the emergency use language is very clear on the FDA website, um, to me, it just seems like there is an open door for someone to have a case against being discriminated, fired, or not let into a university because of that, not uh, because of choosing not to, even if they didn't fall into one of those categories. And to, to part of your question was, you know, are, it, maybe this is something we're going to see play out. I am confident that we will see some of these cases play out. I, 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 I have no doubt in my mind um, that that's going to happen. Uh, if you're so, my prediction is that those cases won't succeed unless 
there are some of the uh, the exceptions that I was talking about. That's my prediction. Yeah. I could be wrong, uh, but that's 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 what I'm anticipating will be the case. Okay, which is interesting, and I'm gonna I, I'm curious to see how they play out as well because if that is the case and they and they um, they play out in the way you're predicting, then the languaging right now on the FDA website that I mean that again clearly states that they they have the option to accept or refuse the vaccine, that needs to go away. Even if it's meant to protect the drug companies, it's clearly stating that an individual has an option right now right. under EAU. Well, so you, you have to, um, th there's a couple of things to keep in mind. So while the FDA is saying you have the option because this is under emergency use, mm -hmm. you got to realize like employers under employment law have the ability to impose lots of different requirements on employees that may be their own, you know, and maybe it's your right to hey do whatever, do what you want. Um, and this is, let, let me give a, 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 an example in a different context. You know, um, one thing that's become a somewhat controversial in recent years is employers taking into consideration off-duty conduct of employees because they don't want the reputational harm that comes with something that happens off duty. And so um, there are some states that are passing or have passed or are attempting to pass statutes that limit employers' ability to um, consider off duty conduct. But if that doesn't exist, and the employer says, look, I don't want you doing this off duty, the employer's free to do that. And you have, you as the employee have no, no cause of action for that. Uh, or the employer take take a different take a different situation. The employer can say, "Look, you can't bring a weapon to the workplace." I think that's not a controversial statement, at least around here in Maryland. In other parts of the country, maybe that is a little bit more controversial. But hey, someone the employee says, "I've got the Second Amendment. I have a constitutional right to bear arms," but that constitutional right doesn't carry over into your workplace because it's not a government imposition a government restriction on your ability uh, to carry that firearm. So uh, the it's a, it's almost like a, I don't want to say a private contracting situation, but it's comparable to that because it's, it's look, this is what I'm, in, I'm requiring for this workplace and you are free to accept it or reject it. Steve, if I could, um, as we move forward and, I, and you know, I don't know all these Latin terms like this caveat, this and that. But as we all move forward, don't we have to all be personally responsible for the decisions we make? You know, whether we want to attend um, a chamber of commerce, you know, banquet or golf tournament, or whether we want to go into a restaurant. I mean, you know, I would hope that if the business owner has been um, reasonably prudent to try to do things. Um, again, as you've gone through, and I thank you for, you know, the thoroughness, you know, we can't require everybody to have a vaccine for various reasons. People object. It's difficult with masks. Um, you know, we can try to put up some plexiglass, but was it high enough and wide enough and sanitized often enough, right? So, you know, maybe that's what the prior administrations were trying to do when they were pushing for some kind of uh, liability exemptions or something, but I don't think we're going to see those. I don't think we're going to see that, um, but uh, there was something that you said, Matt, that's really important, and hopefully that was, and uh, hopefully that came across with what I was uh, talking about is it's reasonableness. What does a reasonable person, or in this case, what does a reasonable business do, or what does a reasonable uh, employer do in the context of what's happening? And was it was the conduct reasonable or was it unreasonable? This, was it negligent, or was it um, un was it or was it reasonable under the circumstances? Um, and you know, I think my again, I, I I think my prediction is employers uh, courts are going to be pretty lenient. I think. Or maybe that's not the right word, but uh, lenient with uh, businesses going forward. This is something that hasn't happened in over 100 years. And there's no perfect solution on how to prevent 
this disease from spreading. Um, at least at this point, you could make arguments at the beginning of the pandemic, what the appropriate thing to do, what, what, what was appropriate to do at the beginning of the pandemic to possibly uh, kill this thing early on. It didn't happen. We are where we are now. And um, by most accounts, this thing is going to be living with us for the foreseeable future in some form or another. Um, you do have a certain percentage of the population that's just not going to take the vaccine for a number of reasons. Uh, some out of what I'll call political beliefs, others out of uh, personal beliefs that are not driven by a religion. Um, um, but and others just they're they're in a situation. Look, I, I'm still you know I, and even then we, we we haven't even gotten to the. Uh, well, it's not really relevant to the workplace, but even then, you know, kids, not all kids can even get this yet. I've got an 11-year-old. On, on her 12th birthday, she's going to go get a shot. Uh, that's what we're doing, uh, but that's not for everyone. Um, but the idea, going back to your original point, Matt, is what are you as a business doing that's reasonable under the circumstances to try to prevent this disease from being spread and getting people sick and ill and possibly dying? Um, and if you're reasonable, not negligent, well, then um that is i think courts are going to find in most instances that people are, that businesses are not going to be held liable we've certainly heard of some stories during the pandemic where employers were being a bit draconian or insensitive or seemingly uncaring um i say seemingly because you know it's just one side's characterization of uh the uh environment um where they were potentially putting people in harm's way you know, uh, if that's happening, well, that may be a different outcome. Um, uh, and so it, it, it's, I think to your point, it, there is a certain, at some point, we've got to make some difficult decisions, but business has to go on. Business has to continue. People can't be held hostage. I know at various points early on the pandemic, I was having um, so lots of uh, several calls from businesses where some employee was just afraid I say just, I don't mean that to denigrate, uh, I don't mean that to belittle the, the employee, but they were afraid to come back to the office, even though the company was taking what I viewed to be at least reasonable precautions to try to make it a safe environment, finding ways to separate employees, finding ways to distance employees um, and, and doing things, but certain things could only be done physically in the workspace. Um, and when the employees was, employee was too afraid, they said, well, then we need to find someone who's going to do this job. And, you know, I had a couple charges of discrimination that came from that. Uh, they seem to have gone nowhere um, uh, fast. Uh, and, and so that uh, they never made their way to court. Um, some still are percolating out there before the administrative agencies, but I don't think those are, I don't think those are going to take. Um, and going back to, again, what I think you were aptly said, Matt, was the reasonableness with which people are acting. Um, but do bear in mind, there are people out there and there are businesses out there that don't act with the same uh, sensitivity or caring or compassion or desire to protect people. And I think those, those businesses risk some serious liability. Are there any other questions for Stephen? Well, I guess not. Then if that's the case, again, thanks for everyone uh, tuning in this morning. I uh, hope it was uh, informative and useful. Um, and uh, if any other questions come up, you know where to find me. Um, so, um, you know, give me a call, shoot me an email. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions I can. Ben, and thank you all for joining us for today's presentation. I have just a few um, chamber events that I wanted to highlight really quickly. Of course, they're found on our website, MarylandChamber.org. On this upcoming Monday, we're having our Spirit of Community Awards celebration. It will be virtual, um, but it's a great celebration of our educators and our public safety as well as military service member of the year. will be at 7 p.m. via Zoom. On May the 25th, the very next day, we have a multi-chamber business leader luncheon with Lieutenant Governor Boyd Rutherford. Um, that will be in person at the BWI Marriott. Um, if you're interested in joining us for that, uh, reservations are due in um, by noon Friday. Um, and 
the Lieutenant Governor is taking questions. Those are due in by noon on Thursday. If you have a question you want to pose to him. And then of course, our upcoming Central Maryland uh, Classic, our golf tournament. Hope that you will see you at, at least one of those events in the near future. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. All right, everyone have a great day.